missed you yesterday in our meeting. Hope you had a good day off. Um, see a lot of our friends joined. Sherry. Sherry told me that she was skipping a very important meeting to be able to join us today. So hi, good to see you. Um, Wei Chen, so happy you could join us. Wei Chen actually is a Ferris Resources um, employee who we don't get to see very often. So good to see you. Um, happy Tuesday, everyone. I wanted to tell you that uh, Anthony is going to be joining us. However, he was in the Catskills today at this really amazing hotel called the Roxbury. Um, and he was driving back and he's caught in a snowstorm. So he said he would join us in a little bit, um, but not quite yet. But I told him, please be careful and drive slowly because the most important thing is for you to be safe. So he will um, pop in when he gets a chance, but we've got a lot of stuff that we can do even before he gets here. So I will be very happy when he joins us, but let's jump into our roadmap. Um, so I wanna spend some time today, like I always do talking about the state of the union, um, talking about some things that are going on in higher education. Um, and then I have lots of new and exciting things for us to discuss today. So we have our new Ferris theme, which I'm gonna roll out. We have some new exciting programming that we're doing. And then I know you all have come to hear about the summit initiative, which I could not be happier about. Um, it's been really re-energizing to us and reminding us of why we do this good work. So that will be really fun. And then hopefully Anthony will be here by then because I want to talk about his sort of masterclass in um, leadership and in, in becoming a guide for um, those that, that are struggling. Uh, and then as I always do, resources. So let's jump in first of all to our State of the Union. A couple of things that I want to talk about specifically. The first one is, um, as many of you know, we have had some real hardships, not just sort of emotionally and with our students, but um, also just in the industry of higher education. And so we always start our time together with me giving you kind of a summary of some of the things that I'm seeing trending in higher education and then also some of the issues that are coming about. Um, the first one that I wanna talk about is a real struggle for our campus budgets. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the sort of budget structure in higher education, about 20 to 30% of your revenue comes from tuition. And then the other 70 or 80% comes from room and board, um, grants and investments. And so if you think about what's happened in our um, institutions since March, a lot of schools are not charging room and board because students have been sent home or they are charging them, but they're doing a lot less. Some of you had to give refunds. And so that issue of the, the budget uh, is something that we're really being forced to think about and to to wrestle with and figure out what we're gonna do about it. So the additional strain for our institutions is that our overall um, freshman enrollment is down 3.6%. No, sorry, that's not true. Our overall enrollment is down 3.6%. For community colleges, it's even um, more robust. So it's down about 10%. And then when we look at freshmen overall, it's down about 13%. And then for our community colleges, freshman enrollment is down 21%. So we have hardships, not just with our budget, but also with our um, students coming and being able to, to enroll and be successful. We also have had a lot of hardships with um, our workforce. So down, you know, 13% for our labor force, it's about 650,000 jobs. Most of those are our lowest paid workers. So if you think about who in your campus you sent home, um, we really have had some difficulties about that. I say all this not to be a downer about it, but actually because I think there's so much opportunity um, as we're thinking about higher education to be really um, inventive um, and innovative about what we're doing um, with our students and with each other and as we're doing cost. And so that leads me to introduce the Ferris theme for 2021. Um, our theme for 2020 was uh, community 
And so we really focused, even as we were sending students home all over the United States, to think about how do we build community? And it was a great um, sort of overarching uh, thought process for us last year when it became so clear that community is vital and really what we're doing um, in many elements of higher education. Our theme this year is Kintsugi. <gasps> Hi, friend. Hello, my friend, how are you? How are you? I got stuck in a snowstorm and I was trying to go down the hill to get to the meeting and uh, the weather and uh, a big salt truck in front of me had other plans. So uh, I'm supposed to be in my suit in front of the camera and unfortunately I'm not, but uh, I finally got some cell uh, service and I decided to stop and make sure that I make the meeting because well, I don't I like disappointing. <laughs> I'm so glad I was just actually showing pictures of where you have been because it looked amazing. And I was sad that you couldn't just stay for a couple more days. You know what? I was going to stay um, to do the meeting, but there was no place because uh, all the rooms were, um, all the rooms were sold out. So I couldn't take a room and the meeting space, what they have is being occupied by people. So they're very, very careful of obviously the COVID protocol. Yeah. So I don't want to put them in a situation to make them uncomfortable. Yeah. So I was like, I'll get down the hill, I'll get to my friend's place, and I'll put, I'll, I'll, it'll all be perfect. And it's, <laughs> but I'm just glad, I'm very blessed that I actually got a, um, a signal. So. Yeah, well, I'm really glad that you joined us. I was happy, I watched you at this hotel, and it's amazing. So um, I'm glad you got to spend some time there. Well, I did not do 20 questions or pictures without you. So are you ready for them? I was born ready. <laughs> okay, let's do pictures first. So listen, Anthony, I just have to tell you about pictures. Um, I'm like scraping the bottom of the barrel for me. Oh, this is a picture <laughs> of you skiing before. Yeah. So I have like the most embarrassing picture of me that exists in my entire life, but I'm not ready to show it yet. So okay. maybe maybe after a couple more months, I'll, I'll pull that one out. So I just found this picture of me and my brother when I was little. That's a beautiful picture. I should yeah. be on a Hallmark card. It's not super embarrassing, but it's the best that I can do. Um, you, on your Instagram, shared this with everybody. Yeah, um, that was a monkey that got out of the cage. <laughs> I mean, but look at those ears. Come on, I look like a monkey and that's okay. No, I love that picture because everybody, I can tell that the direction was like, turn to your side and like, look, and you were just like, full on, like, I'm just going to face the camera. Like I face everything else. Yeah, but to be truth, be, be, be truth in that picture, what was I? It was 76. So I was 65. I was 10 years old. I know I look like I was three, <laughs> but I was actually, I was actually 11 years old in that picture. And I know I look like a little, little boy. There's a young lady all the way to the right of that picture uh, with a big smile on the bottom on the same row as me. Her name's Danielle. And we're actually still friends to this day. And uh, she posted it, and that's how I found it. But um, yeah, I was 11, and I had zero confidence. I was the most insecure, emotional child you'll ever meet. And when people say you would never like a person that was insecure, I was like, dude, are you kidding me? I was, <laughs> I was literally, even when I went in the military, I was a frank little puppy. I had a big voice, like not then, but but I, 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 was, like, yeah. I looked tough. I looked tough, but I, I was, I was afraid. Oh well, he's very precious. It make, makes me feel tender hearted towards you. Okay, let's do 20 <laughs> questions. 20 um, questions. Yeah, actually, but you know, I only ever do 19. So we're going to do 19. Okay. 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 What was the last TV show that you binge watched? Oh, it was the last TV show that I binge watched. Um, actually, my daughter has got me hooked on um, Below Deck. Oh, I don't know that one. Yeah, it's basically the hotel business, but on a ship. Oh, so I binge watched that, but I also binge watched something uh, like I went through the, like seasons, like three seasons in, in, in like no time. Can't remember what it was. It must have been compelling. But yeah, Below Deck is, is something my daughter um, is really into and she, she made me watch on, over the weekend. OK, well, I'll have to check that one out. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? Introvert. I heard you say that on a podcast the other day, and I thought that's something you and I share in common because most people, if they just know us from 
this or from your TV shows would never guess you were an introvert. Oh, a hundred percent. I am so uncomfortable around people. It's pathetic. Yeah. I mean, I was just saying, I was just saying something to Glenn that we were somewhere and, uh, oh no, this was about 15 years ago. I was um, doing a keynote for a company I worked for, for revenue management, because they felt the role of general manager of the company, that I was the best general manager revenue guy. And I went to Oregon and they had like a three day golf outing and dinner and stuff. And they were busting people around. I literally went in, I did what I was supposed to do. And then until I can get a plane out the next morning, I stayed in my room and I didn't go on the golf outing. It was beautiful out. Didn't, do, do, didn't go to dinner with anyone. And when people asked me why, I may believe I was sick, but I just don't like small talk and I don't like hanging out with people I don't know. And I was, that's me. I mean, that's just who I am. I'm not like, I love people and I'm not rude, but I, if, if, if you're not like, if you're, if I don't, if you're not family, I'm just not comfortable. Yeah, that definition of like getting energy from being with people versus getting energy from being by yourself is such a good definition. Cause I think that's right. A lot of times you're like, I mean, I know I talk to people all the time, but the truth is I always end up exhausted after that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Name two things, not people, but two things in your house that you love. My chair. Okay. In, in my yard. Oh, that's good. That makes me happy. Um, what was your favorite age growing up? 20 years old in one day. Because I was, I was, I was leaving to go to the military. Okay. Um, what is the last thing that you read? Um, what was the last thing I read? Um, I just read my friend Sarah's book about service. I'm writing the forward for it. So I wrote it and it's about um, service from within. And I was always a believer that you can't train service from within. And after reading her book, I'm completely convinced I'm completely wrong. Wow, that's pretty yeah. impressive. It, 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 it will be, you will hear me talk about this book constantly and I will send you a copy of it. I yeah. was blown away of how simple, articulate and beautiful she made this book. That's awesome. I would really like to read that. Um, okay, how old were you when you had your first celebrity crush and who was it? Oh, um, it's so funny um, because <laughs> Alyssa Milano, who's, uh, who's the boss, actually played my mother yeah. uh, in my movie, but she was my first celebrity crush. And also Jojo from Facts of Life, Joe from Facts of Life. <laughs> okay, what is one thing that can instantly make your day better? My kids. That's good. In your orange juice. But, uh, uh, on the other side, my kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. Either way, it's a swing, right? It, it just right. depends. Okay, right. in your orange juice, pulp or no pulp? Um, a little bit. If you could go back to any time in history, where would you go? Um, I would go to um, the day Abraham Lincoln made his famous speech. That would be amazing. What is your biggest irrational fear? I, I, I have a horrific fear of heights. Yeah, okay. Um, what, it, what made you most proud in the last year? My daughter, any, any one of my daughters. Whether we, my daughters the way they fought through COVID, um, they, they missed their graduations, who made the volleyball team and then found out that COVID happened so she can't play volleyball this season, just practice. Um, whether it be my daughter who graduated college from the basement uh, and who's handling it, whether it be my other daughter who's um, finishing college and handled everything. She, you know, she had COVID during Christmas and she never came out of the room for a week and a half. And she was the happiest kid in the world. She was always popping off the walls, you know, making us laugh on videos. And so uh, by, by far, my right, Oh my God, I'm going to cry. Yeah. them. <laughs> they, yeah. You can't say all the things that they've had to face this year. Can you? Um, what is your favorite season, like winter, fall, spring, summer, and why? Um, I love, a, I mean, I love a day like this up in the Catskills. It's like literally, this this may be like my fifth favorite day ever as far as just the beauty of what I'm seeing. It's gorgeous. And it's very specific, fifth favorite day ever um, as far as the beauty. Um, I would say I love a good October crispy drizzle with my jean jacket which I don't have anymore, but I used to have. <laughs> well, you don't need the hood 
and you don't need a heavy jacket and you don't need gloves and it's it's crisp those are my favorite days yeah those are my favorite days too um ideally how would you like to spend your birthday alone around my family my immediate family just alone i just want to be alone <laughs> I always, want to be alone. I, always, I always want to be alone. <laughs> What's your to go to go to midnight snack? Oh, uh, my go to midnight snack, um, peanut butter. Really? Like yeah. just out of the jar? Just one little teaspoon of peanut butter, and then I go to sleep sometimes when I'm really hungry. I don't want to eat a lot, so I don't want to eat full. So I'll just have like literally a little teaspoon of peanut butter, and that 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 makes me feel better. It's good. Okay, and the last one, if you had to root for one, would you root for the Jets, the Giants, or the Bills? The Jets. Okay, we just had this conversation the other day somewhere, I think it was on my podcast, when people say the Bills. Do you understand saying the New York, the Buffalo Bills to a guy from the city is like saying you're rooting for Eagles or the Cowboys? It doesn't mean anything to me. Right, them. I do understand that. In the same way that when you talk about like the Catskill Mountains, like New York Catskill, it's the most beautiful mountains and countryside, but people only ever think of New York City, right? Yeah, don't ever, yeah, yeah, don't ever say to me you're from New York and you're from like the Catskills, <laughs> <laughs> or that you're from Buffalo. It's like say you're from New York State. Don't right. you dare infiltrate New York City. You will only ever say you're from Manhattan or you're from like upstate, right? Those are those are your well, only. If you say you're from New York, you're from New York proper, which is the five boroughs. Right. Um, or Long Island, but um, if you're from Buffalo, you say you're from Buffalo, or you say you're from New York State. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, thanks for playing with me. I always appreciate it. And the reason being is just because when you're up here, like it's about guns and fishing and hunting, and and you you could be in Tennessee or Wyoming up here. I mean, just right. it's very rural, and it's this looks like what I'm looking at right now looks like any town uh, USA. You know, mm -hmm. two hours from now, I'm in in Manhattan. Yeah. So it's completely, um, so I don't say it with disrespect. I just say it's just two different lifestyles. Totally different. Yeah, totally different. I agree. Okay, so we, I did our roadmap already. I did some State of the Union. I am talking about um, Kintsugi, which you and I talked on your show when I was with you a couple of weeks ago about making something really beautiful out of something that's broken. And I was saying part of the challenge this year is going to be looking at higher education figuring out places that it's broken, um, that it has been broken and we've just ignored it or ways that it has been broken even more since COVID and then figuring out how to make something really beautiful out of that. Um, and so we talked about this book. It's a great book. I recommend everybody gets it. Um, this is actually our Ferris bowl. So we are gonna have, we just um, bought this bowl to remind us about how Kintsugi, the art of taking something broken and making it beautiful. And it's funny because you, I ordered that book when you mentioned it the first time yeah. and then it, it came to my house and everybody's like, who ordered this book? I said, I have no idea. I just realized <laughs> it's my book. <laughs> yeah, it's a good book. You should read it. It's a really good I will, book. I will. <laughs> um, the other exciting thing before we get into the um, initiative that we're going to talk about today is our new podcast, Cap and Gown. So every Tuesday at two, Anthony's going to be joining me every other week, but Matt and I will be doing our podcast where we're just talking through higher education. We're going to have guests. We're going to think um, about new ideas and new initiatives and resources for everybody. So please join me there. There's lots of ways for you um, to access that. And I'll show you that at the end. Um, we're also doing our um, professional development conference in May. Um, which I think will be really helpful. I'm lining up all of our partners to be able to come and give you some really good resources on that. So those are, I'll, I'll uh, have those in summary at the end, um, but lots of exciting things on the horizon for Ferris. So I want to switch over to our summit initiative. Um, let me just say, if you guys have not read this report, it's, it's um, coming out of Syned, which is a national nonprofit. This report is called Beyond the Pandemic Lessons Learned um, after, after the Pandemic. And it's an exceptional report where they go through lots of different elements. They have things about myths and things that we need to focus on. And it really, Anthony, you and I talked about the summit initiative um, the other day. 
-hmm. just in terms of um, this idea that the pandemic was going to affect everybody equally has really been shown to be completely untrue. So although COVID can affect everybody, um, there is a lot of disparities between affluent college students and lower income ones. Um, many of those students are students of color and the, the most vulnerable of our students have been greatly affected um, by COVID. And to be really fair, a lot of things were broken before. We had a lot of equity gaps before that now all of a sudden we just have a really clear picture um, of because COVID has come to bear. So the number one recommendation um, that this report gives is that we have got to address this accelerating education inequity, that we're seeing it um, increase and it was bad before, it's really bad now. So um, this idea that, that our most vulnerable students are really precariously perched and even without COVID, it doesn't take that much to blow them off course. Um, and then with COVID, it's just been sort of a, an implosion for them. So um, we have really focused on the summit initiative that I'm gonna talk about today. What we're seeing um, in the equity gap is that wealthier students are able to take gap years. So they'll just stay home for a year with their family and it won't be a hardship for them. Whereas um, students from a lower socioeconomic um, rung, if they do not come back to school, they stop out. They just don't come back. And so it's a thing that they really struggle with. Also, we have first generation students whose parents don't understand um, how to give the best support. And we're not doing a good job, a good enough job of explaining to parents, this is what this looks like, and this is what your students should be doing. So there's a, an inequity in parent support there. Um, schools are granting deferrals. So I think we talked about, you have some friends who, their son I think got accepted to Harvard and they're like, hey, I'm gonna defer for a year. Well, those deferrals come, tend to come from families that have a higher socioeconomic level. So we're not crafting sort of an equal class. We're, we're saving these um, admissions for students who have more money. And then obviously- right. And he was actually a kid that played Evan Hansen on Broadway. So that, this gap year is actually helping him because, yeah. you know, it gives him time. So he, like, yeah, exactly. He, 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 he was set. And, and, but a lot, there's another person I know, and I'm talking to them all the time because I'm afraid that uh, it's a, it's a girl. She's not going to go back Yeah. because of, of her situation at home. For sure. Um, we were just talking to a school the other day where they wanted students to be able to register. And so although the student had a balance hold on their account, they lifted the hold. So you owe a thousand dollars, but we want you to be able to come back. So we're going to lift the hold. But there was then no resources to help mitigate that expense. So then when it came time to register for the next semester, they owe a thousand dollars from before and they owe a thousand dollars now. And it's just they can't they can't overcome it. So those right. financial difficulties. And then you and I have talked a lot about just the difficulties of remote learning, right? I don't have a computer, I don't have space, we don't have internet, all of that kind of stuff. And it's really um, exacerbated this educational inequity, which occurred before. It was there before. We just didn't know, we didn't, it wasn't laid bare in the same way that it has been from COVID. Um, so uh, Ferris is investing in what we're calling the summit initiative. And Anthony, you missed my roadmap because I want to lay out the summit initiative and talk about all of the different tools for this. But then you don't know that you have taught a master class on the summit initiative in one of your hotel impossibles. So oh, I, I did. I did. Did I do a good job? You, you did a great job. So I'm going to go through it with you and just talk about like all of the ways that you um, were a guide to somebody who really needed your leadership and in, in kind of closing that gap. So let me let me talk about the summit initiative and then I will we'll switch over to Hotel Impossible. So the first, first thing I'll say with this is we named it the summit initiative because we wanted to pay honor to the student's mindset. The idea that the student is taking on this challenge to finish college. They're determined and they're relentless and they're doing a new thing that maybe they don't have a lot of guidance on, but they're the ones who are climbing, right? We wanna be 
helpful to them, but it's their story and they're the winners in that. And so this sort of imagery of climbing the summit, I think is incredibly important. We really want to, to make sure that students are the hero of this story. So, you know, this um, funnel that we've moved people through, that we move students through all the time, how do we find them? How do we connect with them and solve their problems and then measure? Those elements are all in the summit initiative. So the first thing we want to do is find students who have an equity gap and are um, likely to need an expert guide. How do we identify those students? How do we connect with them through really significant relationships and then solve their problems so that they can have a really clear path to their academic goals? And then obviously we wanna do measurements of all of that so that you can tell your story of success and also so that you can talk to other people about the efficacy of what you're doing. We've done these things and this was the outcome. This is how we were able to close those um, gaps at the institution. So the elements of Summit are um, all of these different pieces, assessments for students, um, looking at the data, being able to identify students through admissions, um, giving them uh, career guidance and vision, and then also being able to go through this consortium. So I wanna start with identify. Um, we're working with our partners at Macmillan um, to give students equity assessments that are really looking at things like, do they have a sense of belonging here? Um, are they having homesickness? Do they have good academic goals? Um, I was listening to you, Anthony, on a podcast the other day, and you were talking about your first, first couple of days in the military and that sense of belonging where you were like, I don't know if this is, if I'm like all these other people here. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Absolutely. I felt completely, completely out of my mind. It, it, uh, I felt like everyone was smarter and I felt like everyone had like a, um, had a coach for lack of a better word or a manager or somebody like got their back. Like, yeah. like I remember, I think the story I was telling was there were squad leaders that, you know, like guys like me just got promoted to leading the squad. And I'm like, I can't put my pants on. And these people are leading us and they're my age. They came in when I came in, they got their head shaved. Like I got my head shaved and they're in charge. Right. It's like, I, I like, like, who was your like coach and your manager when you were a kid? Because yeah. like, your, your, your parents got you ready. And literally I was having trouble with a belt buckle and my TI was yelling at me and these guys are leading us. So it was, it was insane. So, so that feeling has never left me. And it's the, how did you get a head start on this? How is it that you are coming into this light years ahead of where I'm coming in and I thought we would be in the same place, right? Which is a really huge problem on campuses. People feeling like I don't have someone in my corner who's going to be able to help me. Right. And, and, and what really exasperates it, and I think you're doing a great job of outlining the issue, is you really want it bad. Like you want your degree bad because that is your golden ticket. So, so you're exasperated because you feel completely, you know, out of the loop. Um, but you want it as bad as you want it anything. So all of a sudden you get hit by COVID. You're already on, on you know, you just barely got here, right? You just, you, you ran onto that garage before it closed and you got here. Yeah. And now you get slapped again. And you want it twice as bad, but there's so much emotion to that. And so I, I, I really feel kind of what you're, you're, you're saying. And, and I think it is, yeah. I, Can you hear me? Yes, I got you. Mm -hmm. I got you. I got you. You sound like you're from Brooklyn. I got you. I got you. <laughs> um, so not only will we ask students, do you feel like you belong here? Do you feel like you have what you need to succeed? But also talking to admissions counselors about how do we identify students with non-cognitive concerns? Do they have institutional commitment? Do they have clear goals? Do they have a good vision for how college is going to help them? And then some really robust um, data analytics. We have data analysts who are looking into schools, um, historical data, and identifying populations of students who historically have not retained and graduated as well as sort of the average population. And what's really interesting about that is though, although there are some common themes, for every school, it's different. Some schools do a great job of retaining and graduating um, athletes. 
some schools do a better job of graduating males. Um, and so just trying to understand who is your student population? Where do those equity gaps actually exist? Are they about um, gender or are they about socioeconomic level or are they about race? How do we target those populations where, you know, we've said, you and I have said before, it's like you let the student into your school, you have to have a clear pathway for them to be able to be successful. It's not enough just to say, yeah, come and good luck. We really have to have some good scaffolding and some um, clear picture that they're going to need extra intervention. And that's really the moment in your life where you want um, freedom, but you want you still need supervision. It's like all of a sudden, it's like you're 18 years old. It's like you go away to college, you have all this freedom, and you don't know what to do with it. It's like you're you want it, but you also don't want don't take the training wheels off ex yet. Yeah, you know, I went down the block without falling, but. You know, I'm not ready for you to take the training wheels off. And I think a lot of colleges, at least from my experience of my children, they struggle with that because they're like, well, you know, you know well, parent, we can't tell you anything and we don't want you involved. But then you get a call saying. The thing's happening. Thank God I didn't get those calls. But, um, but my friends have. It's like, well, you gave them too much freedom too quickly and you didn't want to talk to us and you wouldn't let us involved, but you didn't catch them. Right. So, so if you're not going to let me catch them, then you catch them. That's what I'm paying you for. And so many parents want to hear. In fact, we just heard from a president of a school that we served that said, parents want to hear that we will know their child and we will assess and help them when it's appropriate. Not that we just have a free for all, but that we really are going to get very, very good at helping students um, persist and then go on to, to graduation. It's because it's not fair. You know, I, I said the other day, I have a PhD and figure it out. I didn't have a PhD and figure it out, you know, when I was 18. Um, so you, you have to have the training wheels on. And as a college university, you have to understand, yes, you want, you want as a parent, I want my kid to have freedom. I want my kid to have the training wheels taken off, but if I'm not going to catch him, you better catch him. Right, right. Somebody has to be there, right? Somebody has to be right. looking out for them. Absolutely. Right. Um, so that first element of identify, I think, is so important. And then once we've identified those populations in our summit initiative, we call those our summit students. We work with schools to do a communication audit. And I just can't tell you how important this is when you're speaking, when, when we get to Hotel Impossible, you just, you're so masterful at choosing the exact right words to convey confidence and vision, um, which is really important. And not the you're in trouble, you're doing a thing wrong, but instead, hey, you're invited into this community and this team, and I'm gonna help you understand we always laugh in our office about like first generation students. When you say something like office hours to first generation students, what they think is that's a time when my professor is busy and I should not go bo bother them. They're in their office, right? When actually what we mean is the total opposite of that. We should call it visiting hours. And then students would be like, oh, that, that's when I should go visit my, my faculty. So that being so careful of your language and what you say to students is really important. And we have some best practice language that we will share with our initiative, our, our summit initiative mm -hmm. schools, but also just going through and understanding how you're talking to people is so vital. You know, I, I, I had a moment, I was up at a casino yesterday doing our podcast and the director of marketing's daughter, who is uh, ninth grade, is a big fan of mine. So my producer said, hey, you mind getting on the phone? I said, of course. So give me the phone. So I take the phone. I call her up. And all of a sudden, she's on with me. And she's all kind of stressed out. And I was like, so why do you like the show? And she was kind of trying to tell me, but she was stressed out. And I said, so how is it learning from home? How is it? And she's like, it's OK. And I said, it sucks, right? And she goes, so bad. And like, and like just that I said that, and I, I chose that word on purpose, because it's like, come on. Let, let, let's be honest. Yeah. Right. And, and she immediately became a different person. Yeah. That's a great example of like, there is some pomp and circumstance in higher education that is unavoidable, but there's right. also real talk, right? There's also right. like, let's tell the truth about what's actually going on and talk to each other in the language that makes sense. Oh, my, my, my kids, their favorite professors, maybe not the best professors, maybe not learning the most, but their favorite professors that they pay attention to are the ones that from time to time drop language they probably shouldn't drop but it makes them normal and it makes them human and 
and it connects them and it like they make them laugh and they make them joke and they're like listen we like there was one professor that said listen it's eight o'clock in the morning you all got your cameras off you're all on social media and you're barely awake but there's gonna be a test next week so try to pay attention a little bit and yeah. like that's the way of getting my attention because now i'm really going to pay attention yeah because you know before, what i'm if, if, doing right right if you yelled at me saying yo listen kids you understand yet? There's gonna be tests like you know what? My my internet doesn't work all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, okay, the next element of summit is our software, which if you're not using our software, you should be. Um, this is a way that you're gonna keep track of everything that's happening. I don't know if you're not using case management collaboration software, how you have managed um the last couple of months. But um, this is a really key piece because it's going to share the right information with the right people. Um, okay, the I have two more summit initiative elements. The next okay, one can I interrupt you one more time? Yes. You please. just said the right information to the right people. That's it. That's business, whether it be higher education or whether it be business. You know, we're developing this project that I'm working on. And like we have, we're developing, uh, somebody introduced me to software. I was like, that's what I need. I need that. I need that. I, I was thinking I didn't need that. It was like, oh, as soon as I saw it, I was like, because the right information to the right people at the right time. And if you don't have it, whether it's a construction project, a hotel project, or high education, you know, that just elevates the stress level of everyone. Yeah, that's right. It makes you less efficient. It makes you more stressed out. And it makes it more likely that you're going to make a mistake because you missed something, right? Right. Okay, so let me talk about Pathlight. Pathlight's the next element in summit, um, our summit initiative. And this is about giving students a vision for success in the institution. Um, this is something that I'm really passionate about. This is a, a company that um, Matt and I have worked together sort of separately from Ferris for a long time. When I worked at an institution, I developed this because students, um, Anthony, it's really sad. So I get really, really overwhelmed about this piece. I had students who would come to me and say, I'm not sure about my major. I'm not sure about my career. I'm not sure that college is right for me. And I would say, tell me what you're good at. And they would say, I don't know. No one's ever told me what I'm good at, which is heartbreaking. Um, and sometimes it's because parents didn't know that they should be doing it. Sometimes it's because parents are working too hard to be able to pay attention to that. They're trying to put food on the table. They don't know that that's a thing that they should be doing. They don't have time to do that, right? So students understanding how college is going to change their lives, understanding themselves, knowing what they're good at, having a clear path for success is so important to students being able to then go on to graduate because if i'm taking stupid classes and i don't really like my major and i'm not sure what job i'm going to get i don't know why i'm going to continue in college you know when you said you know no one ever told me i'm good at anything and it's like i don't know what i'm good at if you asked me at 18 you know what are you good at i would have melted down and, and cried like a three-year-old because i had no idea i have no idea yeah. You know, I probably I didn't know what I was good at until I was 40. And no one's ever told me, you know, until I started to get some level of success, what I was good at. And to yeah. this day, I'm not good at a lot of things, but there's some things I'm really good at. And I would say it's taken me to I was maybe even older than 40 to realize I'm really good at figuring stuff out. Yeah. Whatever. You no know, situations. I that, so that's exactly what you were talking about before the head start you would have had if when you started the military, you're like, one thing I know, I've been told since I was little that I am very good at figuring things out. And that's the tool that's in my toolkit, right? So right. yeah, being able to have a clear understanding of who you are and what you're good at and how you're going to impact the world for good, I think gives these college students a vision for ultimate success. Right. And what you're good at is not always what you're passionate about, right? Right. So I think that that is, um, really important too it's just because you're good at it everybody's telling you you're good at it but you're not passionate about it how many people have we heard is like well i was forced to do whatever i was talking to the vice president of the resorts world yesterday in the catskills and he went to dentist school and then you know to, to make money uh during after, or during dental school he worked in the hotel business and now he he said screw dental school i'm now i'd really like the hotel business wow and wow. And, and you know and that's fascinating to me you yeah. know it's um you know i don't know how i found my passion but it was just very i was 
haphazardly and it was lost. But I think that that is such a key question I never really thought about. It's like, what do you, I'm actually, I'm, I know there's two of my daughters. I do a good job with that. And there's one daughter who's like me, um, who is really good at figuring stuff out. And they never told her that. You have to tell her. I'm going to tell as soon as I get home. Good, good. There's just something so affirming of somebody saying like, hey, you know what? You're really good at this thing. Thank you. Thank you for that. So it's yeah. good. Um, so there's a whole element of that educational piece, how we teach people what they're good at. And then the last piece of our initiative is our consortium. This is just how we're going to share best practices, how we're going to talk about struggles, how we're going to talk about innovative programs um, and then doing benchmarking and comparisons about what your institution is doing versus other institutions. I think that community piece will really help us tackle this problem um, because I don't think it's one that higher education just can just kind of continue to pretend like doesn't exist. It does exist. We have to put our brains together and figure out how we're going to close this equity gap and what we're going to do so that students can be successful um, at our institutions and that kind of um, coming at it from all sides every institution saying we're just we've got to solve this now i think will be really powerful well i, well, I think if you look at a student as an employee right you don't you don't like give an employee everything employees have to work and figure it out but you got to give them a confidence and a level of understanding that if you don't have it here, you can find it here and we're all on the same team. And so what happens is it's like, well, they're students. Well, if you treat them like an employee, and I don't mean that in the true sense of the word, but that they belong to you. Like right. They're the person that's going to say, this is a good place to work or this is a bad place to work. Right. And, and if you look at it from that perspective, that may be able to give you a better understanding of it. And again, I only have an understanding of what I've seen in the last four years. And I would, I'm not really excited about the way these colleges, there's one college that my, my daughter graduated early and now we were hoping that she would have a graduation in May. And they were saying, there's not gonna be a graduation, it's gonna be online. And I was like, there's so many spaces you can have a graduation in New York City that you can, like, I don't understand. And like, it's the first time that I'm actually irritated. Right. Like really irritated because I spent all this money. My daughter spent all this time and you literally can't figure out how to have her mask on and have my daughter pick up a piece of paper, even if it's from a table with an audience that's socially separate. But somehow they can figure out how to have a Super Bowl. That pissed me off. <laughs> You're like priorities, people. Priorities. Yeah. I mean, because it, it is the end of a really important thing, right? It is. We should be celebrating that. You should be thinking And I that. understand I'm the first person to 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 really say, hey, we gotta be safe. But come on. Yeah. You can't yeah. You, you you can't figure this out at this point. We we can figure this out. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, okay, so that is the overview of our summit initiative. Like I said, everybody at Fierce is super excited about it. If it's something that you want on your campus, please um let us know. We're putting together our fall 2021. Um, cohorts. So thinking about how do you deliver this for your students as soon as possible uh, so that we can really start making an impression on I, your success. I, I can't imagine if I was running a school, and again, you know, we don't discuss this stuff prior to these conversations. I would, I couldn't imagine like not being involved in this. Yeah. yeah. Especially yeah. now. When everybody's so separated, and everybody, everybody, a lot of people are faking it. Like there's some people who have just fallen apart, and you know those people. But then there's a lot of us, including me. We're faking a lot of it. Like yeah. we're just trying to get through, man. Right. We're, we're just, fine. Uh, we're fine. It's fine. We're fine. We're fine. We're fine. Go we're fine. Down. <laughs> right? And you have those moments, and, and like I, I just went down to you know when I was up, up in the Catskills. I was down near the the the. Um, falls and i was just i was having the moment going ah oh, i can breathe and i needed that moment like we're fine we're fine so no one's fine and no so we need fine. things like this we need we need organizations like this we need us to really understand no one is okay yeah that's right we we've been saying like you had at-risk students before they're more at risk and then you had other students who weren't at risk and they're at risk now too everybody's right? at risk my, my daughter is just talking to my risk. children like oh, my children if they have 20 friends that you know all three of them talk about individually 
Like every single one of them have a story. Who's not going back? Who wants to go back, but they're, they're learning in their, in, their, in their room, so they don't want to go back. How many people are like, there's no social life? Like every single one of them have had a really negative experience um, mm-hmm. that they're just really, that's overwhelming. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, we're excited for more schools to join this initiative because I really do think that we're going to be able to make a huge um, impact on students. Okay, let's move to Anthony's master class. This is where I just break down for you Anthony's genius and all of the things that he does on Hotel Impossible that are um, applicable to our colleges and institutions. And please don't call it don't call it genius. Call it super genius. Super genius. Sorry. <laughs> I, I misspoke. I meant super genius there. So yeah, or, or, one thing that yeah. you're so good at, Anthony, is that you're such a good guide for people. And that's how we've been thinking about the summit initiative, that you have somebody who's trying to do something amazing like climb a summit. And they need, like you said, a coach or a guide or somebody to be like, hey, this is what, just stick with me. Just stick with me. And we're going to be successful in this. So I want to talk about this hotel. Let's see. I always, first, let's see if you know where it is. Here's the map. Okay, show show the next one. Is it? Oh, this is in uh, Jamaica. This is in Jamaica. This is the Gardenia Resort in Jamaica. Um, so that's the sign, and then on the right you can see there's a goat, which I think your exact quote was, "I think I hear a goat just like Brooklyn." <laughs> <laughs> so the owner of this hotel, his name is Carlisle. And he, um, he was investing in this hotel, um, but you had to sit down with him. And first of all, I have a picture of you because I've never seen this tie before, but I really like it. <laughs> Seriously, I, when I was watching it, I was like, that's a really nice tie. So I like Thank that you. one. <laughs> um, so you were having a sit down with him. Here's the, the foyer. Um, you asked him, could we invest $200,000? He said, no, here's the bathroom. You said, could you invest $100,000 to make this better? He said, no. <laughs> then you said, how about $10,000? He's like, no, basically I don't have any money. Um, you said this looks like a Jamaican prison, right? Yeah, and, and, and that actually looks really good compared to what it really looked like in person. Really? Yeah, that, yeah that's, that, that's the Waldorf Astoria. <laughs> that, that picture looks a lot nicer than what I was, was seeing. Okay. Well, who I actually want to talk about is Richard Miller, this man who's the GM. And I want to talk about how you led him to success. So the first thing that you did was you made him the hero of the story. It was not like I'm Anthony and I'm going to come in and I'm going to fix everything and you're going to do what I say and then everything's going to be great. You really, in the beginning, when you very first met him, first of all, he shook your hand for like, five minutes. He was very earnest. He was very nervous. And you said to him, Hey, I want to hear what you have to say. Help me understand your biggest challenge. Like you really tried to say you are going to be the hero of this story. You also said, I have never had difficulty, such difficulty drawing someone out because he was so timid and quiet. Right. And we never meet. We never meet. So when we see each other, I was said before, like we're I'm meeting him for the first time. I don't know. Who, I don't know who he exists up until the second I meet him. I have no idea who he is. I don't yeah. know what his problems are. I don't know that I have can't draw him out. Well, and that's good and bad. You know, for me, it's it's good because I get the true him, but it's also bad because I have no idea what the hell I'm going to say next. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you just said to him in all these subtle ways, which I think is related to the summit initiative, you are important. You are going to do good work. We're going to figure out how to make this. You are going to climb the mountain, right? I'm not the, I'm not the hero. You're going to climb the mountain. So that's the first thing is just saying you are the hero and you're going to do amazing work. And I'm going to be your guide, which I really um, love. The next thing that you did (laughs) was you had to teach him some things, right? So, um, called to book the room. He was like, here's the, here's the price I'm going to give you. Okay. Have a good day. Right. And your producer was like, hey, hold on, hold on. Do I need a confirmation? He's like, no, you can just email me and then hung up, which this right. is so, 
Right. So what's happening is my producer, who's actually still my good friend and still produces stuff with me, he he was just a young kid back then, and um, he was calling him. Um, they have no idea I'm listening. Um, he has no idea we're on the phone. That I'm on the phone. They just think it's a guest. And my producer is just like, "What are you doing?" So yeah. So that's. Sure. This is your uh, face after. This is your face after he just hangs up. Let's see. Have a good day. <laughs> like, did that honestly just happen? But Anthony, what I like about this, as we're thinking about guiding the people on the path, is that you went back and you said you said to Richard, "With all due respect, do I need to tell you that you have to book that uh, that um, stay?" And he was like, yes, I didn't, I didn't know that. Right. And so then you were like, okay, well, you get two calls a day. And if you can book them, this is what it's going to mean. But I really appreciated that you were intrusive with him. You weren't just like, why wouldn't you Hey, with all due respect? Is that a thing that I have to teach you? You also said later when he said he was talking about something, he said, that's a fact. And you said, no, you need to say that assertively. And so then he said, okay, that's a fact. And you were like, okay, good job. You just, it's this idea of don't assume that they know what they should be doing with so many of our students. You can't assume that they know how to pick their major or go to classes or talk to faculty. You actually have to go in and say, this is the thing that I want you to be doing, which you did such a good job of. You also yeah, and, I, and I, I think what's, and that is right, but I think what's really important is most people want you to say that. Most people want you to say, I need help yeah. because it justifies their existence. Like I'm there, you know, I'm sent over there to do the show, but I need to justify that I am the right guy to be doing the show in this moment. And I'm the right guy to be talking to you. So I got to justify myself by you telling me something you need so I can show everybody how smart I am. <laughs> now, that's not what I'm thinking about. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not saying, oh, I need him to, so I can justify my existence. But really when you break it down as human beings, a professor or, or whoever it is, is like, you need to ask us tough questions so we can show you that we can help you. And we, we all need that. Guide. Yeah, we wanna be an expert guide for you. Please let us do that. You also said something I really liked, which is you said, today is the day we transition you to be the general manager which I really love too, because it's that journey, right? It's like, we have some things we're going to work on, but this is the starting point for our, for our journey. Okay. The next thing is this leadership piece, which let me um, say what happened and then we can talk about it. So you came back after that meeting and you met with him and Carlisle and in the middle of it, he got really overwhelmed. And he said to you, can I please take a minute, which you were gracious to him to be like, I'm not trying to shame you in front of everyone. I'm not trying to make you look stupid. I'm not, yes, please go take a minute. And then turned off the cameras. They stepped back while you had this whole conversation. And your conversation with him is about leadership. You said, I need you to be a leader. And he said, I'm a coward. And you said, if I ask you to take a step, will you do it? You have to trust me. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. And he said, I will take a step, right? Which was such a... I thought lovely way to say we're in this together and I'm going to walk with you. And it's not that I'm just like, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And I don't know what we're going to do. You're making, you're making me cry. Take Cause I remember that moment. That moment was very important to me. Yeah. He was so precious and it was the right language for him. Right. I'm on your side. I'm going to be your guide. Stick with me and we'll be successful. So, you know, and, and, and that, in that moment, if we, can I interject? Great. Yeah, please. In, in, in that moment, he's kind. He said he's a coward. I'm an aggressive person that can hold anybody accountable, but I'm also a very sensitive person. So in leadership, whether you're a professor or, or an assistant, whoever, whatever profession you have, when you have a toolbox, you have to know when to touch that tool. And when I was speaking to him, what kind of person am I if I was aggressive? It's like we're all cowards, man. We're all we're all just trying to get by. We're all squirrels just trying to get a nut. We're just we're just all figuring it out. And so when someone is nice, when someone's transparent, and someone's saying, "Please, I'm a coward. I don't know," like you're saying, "Okay, 
let's 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 talk about that. Why do we feel this way? Now, if you come at me and you're like, Anthony, you don't know what you're talking about and just leave me alone, then that's another tool. That's called a sledgehammer. <laughs> okay. And th- and that and, and and that, you know, um, you don't need a sledgehammer for, for, for everything. And so that is really the secret to me of leadership is no one likes confrontation, but you have you have to have confrontation. And right. it doesn't have to be in fifth gear all the time. But yeah. confrontation can be very gentle, but it has to happen. That's right. Yeah. We don't just leave him there saying I'm a coward and you're like, well, then I guess, right? Because you had that confrontation, then he actually moved forward. Or 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 shame him because he's a coward, or don't accept the word he's using. Yeah. Accepting the word he's using to describe himself is critical because yeah. I may not say it. I don't like the word that you use for yourself, but it doesn't matter. When you wake up in the morning, you see yourself as a coward. So we've got it. We've got to fix that. At you least, at that. least identify, identify it. Yeah, that's so good. So you made him jump off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we made him jump off a cliff. Yeah. So I like <laughs> this though because it's opportunities for success. You so you took him to this cafe. And then you were like, um, hey, I want you to jump. You stood up there with him and he said, uh-uh. And then I didn't bring my swimsuit. And you're like, don't worry. I'm the leader. I brought you a swimsuit. So you can jump off this cliff, right? And then I love this thing um, where you said, you, you're, I know you're nervous, but it's going to boost your confidence. How are you feeling? Honestly, scared. You can do it. And I love this moment right before he jumps. We talk about in counseling self-soothing, which the example is like right before you jump off everything that you're saying to yourself to say, it's okay. You're going to be okay. It's not going to kill you. All of that self-soothing. So he took a minute and then he jumped off and he was so proud of himself. So you were cheering him. And then this, this next picture of him is just like his He's not a coward in this moment. And what's important about this moment is he is petrified of heights and more petrified of the water. He is literally, these are his two greatest fears. And when he did it, and I, I, we, you know, we bet against, uh, a lot of my uh, team bet against him. He wouldn't do it. I mean, it was a real crippling, paralyzing fear. Yeah. And that, when he did that, that elation and that smile was like, and he talked about it even afterwards and we stayed in contact a little bit. He's like, it changed his life. Yeah. Yeah. So what I like about that is it's an opportunity for success. You said to him, you, this is how you're defining yourself, but we're going to do this thing you can do. And then you'll know you're not a coward. You'll have this thing to look back on and say, no, actually I can do hard things. There is a time when I can conquer that fear. So I really love that piece. Also, you jumped off with him, which you said, I hate heights. So good work. You yeah, I was afraid. I was really afraid. <laughs> you can't ask him to jump off and be like, no way. I'm not. I'm not at all. <laughs> okay. I'm almost done. I have the last piece, which is, oh no, two more pieces. So um, give them a vision. So then you came back to the owner and you said, he did an awesome job. You said you lacked confidence, but if you have the courage to jump off a cliff, once you make up your mind, you can do anything. And just because you're quiet, does not mean you're not brave, which he was so, <laughs> he was so happy. You were also very happy. Well, um, it, it really upsets me because quiet people are overlooked. And because I'm kind of aggressive and loud, I'll get a lot of attention in the room. But I want that person who's quiet and, and, and wants to speak, I want, I want to give them a megaphone as well. Yeah. But they don't know how to use it. So I'm very protective over people who are quiet because a lot of times they're smarter and have more to say than I do. Yeah. Well, what you did when you talked to him is you gave him a vision for how he can be successful. He doesn't have to be like you. He doesn't have to be like the owner. He doesn't have to be like this other person. He's not. You're saying, given who you are and what you're doing, you can be successful here. You don't have to worry about whatever you think you can't conquer because you can. So I really love that thinking about students being able to say, 
someone like you can be successful on this campus. Someone like you will be able to graduate and do really amazing things. So I, I love that piece. And then the last thing you did, which is so important is making it tangible. So after you celebrated him and said, you're gonna, I have this vision for how you can be successful. You gave him a picture of him drop, jumping off. And you said, I wanna commemorate this. This is something weighty that when you feel like you're a coward or you feel like you can't do something hard or you feel uncertain, you have to come back and see this and say, that's not true about me. I, I did something really amazing that I was scared of. Yeah, and, and, and the, the backstory to that picture was, you know, everybody like had no idea I wanted something. And I remember walking around going, I need something, I need something. I felt empty, I felt naked. I felt like I'm leaving and I don't have that thing. And I don't know what that thing is. And I don't remember if somebody told me, maybe we should give him a picture. But I just remember being desperate to, I have to hand this guy something. Yeah. And we got the picture in rapid time and it wasn't easy where we were. And it was just so important to me. I would, I felt like, I know this sounds ridiculous, you did so much work, but I felt like a fraud. Like if I did not button it up with this, then like it's all for show. Like, like you need to hold on to this and don't think of me. Don't think about the show. Think of you. Like, this isn't a me problem. This is a you problem. And think of that moment. I remember, like it was yesterday, the desperation I felt in making sure I put a button on it. And it's, it's something that he can have, right? That's what's right. so important about it. You That's have the to give them something that they can then be like, I climbed to the summit. I did this thing and I'm never going to doubt it again. It's what you're saying about graduation. The reason we have diplomas is because we want something to hold on to, to say, this is how I got this thing. And it was really amazing and hard. And I feel proud of myself for it. Right. So I, I really love that. Um, the like insight to be able to say, especially for him, he's going to have to revisit this thing that he did and he needs to be able to hold on to something for that. Yeah, we I really like, we felt like brothers and I still, to this day, I haven't spoken to him in a, in a, in a while, but I still feel like he's my brother. I feel like he's, uh, what did he say? Um, my, my Jamaican brother from another mother. <laughs> Well, it's such a good, you know, when we talk about a summit initiative, somebody is going to climb this mountain and there's programs and we've got to identify students and we've got to connect with them and we need technology and we've got to talk to them about career. But I think what you show in this show is how, as a person, what, what is your posture towards other people? How do you give them touch points? How do you encourage them? How do you lead them? And the language that you're using to lead them through to success is as important, if not more important than these other, how do we find them? How do we connect with them, right? Those sorts of things. It's, cr it's critical because there's, there's, there's a lot of different people. If you push me, I ain't going. Yeah. I'm just, I'm not the guy like, it was like, oh, come on, Anthony, don't do that to me. Like, like the way I spoke to Richard is the way people need to speak to me. I don't want to do something. Come at me that way. I'm yeah. not, I, I just don't like it. I, I don't watch Super Bowls with anyone because I don't want to hear all that rah rah. <laughs> I am the person like you want to come at me subtly. And right. if you come at me subtly and you say, "Hey, Anthony, let's talk about this." You got me. You come at me aggressively, and I'm not moving. I'm not triple downing. Not moving. Yeah, yeah. I think you and I might have that in common. I don't. <laughs> and, I don't and, <laughs> You know? Yeah, don't push right, don't push me right. And, and, and but that's so critical when it comes to students because that's when students shut down. It's right. like, come on, come on, just come to this meeting, come on, just fill this out, just come on, come on. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, yeah. this allows you to do it in a very subtle way with your, your everything that you're working on. And, you know, and, and we forget that, you know, that there's every everybody's different and everybody needs their way. Yeah, that's right. And I love the idea of we are guides. We are not bosses. We are not somebody who's the hero. We are gonna guide our students in the way that they should go. So let me um, reiterate all of the resources that we have. I told you guys Kintsugi is our um, theme for the year. So please, um, it's a great book. I would encourage you to read it. I don't know anybody whose mental health will not be increased by the idea that although things are broken, they can be made beautiful again. So I think that's a great resource. Um, the next thing that I wanna encourage you about is um, our um, professional development conference. The 
theme of that is golden repair, which is specifically about Kintsugi, but I think it will be a really powerful time for us to all spend together and talk about what's happening for us. Um, also, cap and gown, we're really excited about it. So next Tuesday, Matt and I will be on and then Anthony will be on with us in two weeks, but please, there's lots of ways for you to be able to find that um, online. So um, any place that you find a podcast, you can find that now. And then I think I have one more. Oh, I told you about this report. I think it would be really helpful. And then if you guys are interested in talking about becoming a summit initiative school, um, please, uh, Shauna's email is there. She will be able to um, give you more information. I'm also gonna do a meeting in a, um, probably about a week or so where I go into all the details. So all of the data, everything we're gonna do, what that program looks like specifically. But I think that you can see that the foundation of that program is really passion for students and being able to be guides for them as they're doing this thing that is really hard so that we can lead them on to success. So I'm looking forward to, to that um, class. Anthony, you've been sitting in a snowstorm for an hour. Are you snowed in? No, <laughs> I'm not snowed in. Okay. Um, I am... Uh, Actually, I got down the worst part of it. The, wor the worst part right. of it was a little scary, I'll be honest with you. Well, I said, after I got off the phone with you and I was like, hey, I just need Anthony to be very careful because if I am responsible for the destruction of the national treasure that is Anthony, I will be very distressed. <laughs> you know, I'll be honest with you. you. You know, we talk about the way you talk to people. And I think you know me by now. It's like, if I say I'm gonna do something, I'm gonna do it. And when I realized I just got myself in a situation, I should have figured it out. Like I should have stayed up there and found another place. I should have figured it out. I thought I had plenty of time. When I called you, where I barely had cell connection, you made me feel so comfortable and so safe that I literally slowed down. Well, I was literally going a little faster than I should have been down that hill. And when you made me feel, you say, hey, I got this, I'm gonna do this, that. Don't worry about it, just be careful. You literally made me comfortable and you made me slow down. So that's what this is about, right? That's what you do. Right. Is like like there's you make people comfortable and as leaders and people in charge and people that are running companies is at the end of the day you know we got to make each other feel comfortable so thank you for that because that yeah. really made a big difference. Good, I'm so glad. Thank you for joining me. I always appreciate it, um, and we will connect in a couple of weeks. Thanks, guys. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.